Let me tell you a bit about uh, Nicholas. Nicholas Van Mighem is uh, the clinical director of uh, cardiac interventions in the Thorax Center in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. He's a good friend of mine for many years, million different projects. Uh, he underwent his fellowships in uh, Belgium and in Lenox Hill in New York and then in uh, the Netherlands. He has a particular focus in transcatheter uh, valve innovations and uh, different interventions and the PI of uh, numerous uh, studies, unload uh, neuroprotection devices, also focused on uh, mechanical circulatory support and cal treatment of calcified uh, lesions. And uh, he published more than 350 different papers. So please, uh, Nicolas. So thank you very much, uh, Danny. Also, thank you, Dr. Amagar, for the kind invitation. It's early in, uh, in Rotterdam. It's six o'clock in the morning, but it's a, it's a true pleasure to be, uh, to be part of this session. And uh, in the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes, I will talk about the IVEC-2L for mechanical support facilitated high-risk PCI. And if you are struggling with um, Impella, this definitely is an interesting technology to look, for, to look out for, uh, as it is uh, absolutely cheaper, but also very easy to use as it builds on uh, conventional uh, balloon pumping concepts. And uh, now see, uh, these are my conflicts. So I'm involved with a lot of uh, industry partners and I think if we go back uh, to the, the, the topic of today, high-risk PCI, then uh, what we typically do there, we balance the anatomical complexity and surgical risk. And you see on this slide that uh, as we move to the higher uh, risk spectrum or patients at prohibitive operative risk and then combine it with a medium to high anatomical complexity, that is the sweet spot for patients who might benefit from uh, mechanical circulatory support. I think there are several assets uh, for mechanical circulatory support in high-risk PCI, and high-risk PCI can be defined as uh, patients with uh, one or more of the following, poor LV function, complex coronary anatomies, three vessel disease, uh, single remaining vessels, unprotected left main, but also uh, the application of mechanical circulatory support in cardiogenic shock and complex EP ablation procedures, for instance, VT ablations in patients with poor ventricles. In those situations, as if we now focus on high-risk PCI, we know that in-hospital mortality can be as high as 15%. And the additional consideration for a mechanical support is that it provides hemodynamic stability to perform a challenging execution of uh, your complex PCI. So you can do, you can approach heavy calcified, uh, heavily calcified lesions with atherectomy. You can also go for complex bifurcations using double stent techniques, also in poor LVs, also in the left main because you have the support of mechanical circulatory support devices and you don't need to compromise when aiming for a perfect result. So especially when you also consider younger patients with potentially a longer life expectancy, you would want to have the alternative to a quick and dirty approach, but then you might want to protect your patients with mechanical support. It is all about timing, both in cardiogenic shock, but also in high-risk PCI. You need to define the proper timing and you need to anticipate, you need to escalate when it's needed, choose wisely which device, but also I think it's important to minimize inotropic and vasopressor support. We know from the ICU literature that these drugs are not so good for your patients uh, on the long run. And this is why I believe it makes total sense for uh, an earlier adoption of mechanical circulatory support in your practice. And this is also being supported by more and more of the ICU and cardiology community. If we then uh, take the example of um, mechanical circulatory support that uses large bore access, and then I'm talking about Impella, but also uh, ivec 2 l by Pulscat, then I think it's important to exclude significant aortic valve disease, because what you're going to do is you're going to uh, introduce a device and 
uh, implanted across the aortic valve in the left ventricle. So you, you need to exclude significant, and then with significant, I mean more than moderate aortic stenosis and definitely also um, severe aortic regurgitation. That said, there is uh, a little bit of a modification these days. We do use uh, these support devices also in patients with uh, severe aortic stenosis especially then uh, to follow up on uh, balloon aortic valve veloplasty in preparation for a complex PCI. And apart from uh, aortic valve disease, the other thing to exclude is significant peripheral arterial disease because we're working with large bore access and for the pulse cat IVEC2L, this means a 17 French catheter. Uh, that needs to be inserted. Uh, so you need to make sure that the uh, peripheral arterial access is more than six millimeters or at least more than 5.5 millimeters without calcium. I think it's mandatory when you approach a large bore access to use ultrasound guided access, not only to protect yourself. So the, the less radiation you use, the less radiation also is exposed to yourself and to your hands. So this is why uh, in the thorax center, we always rely on ultrasound guided access. It is important there to identify the uh, femoral bifurcation, as you can see here, and then do the puncture under uh, a cross-sectional view, not the longitudinal view. And here you can see that you uh, move from distally to proximal, and then you enter into the bifurcation and above into the common femoral artery. So this is how ultrasound guided access is uh, in real life. Uh, it is a single operator technique. With your left hand, you uh, manipulate the linear probe and with your right hand, you do the puncture. You make sure you see tenting on the common femoral artery. And then as you are in, you continue with a Seldinger technique. Now focus on mechanical circulatory support devices. And this is a, a raw schematic uh, representation of what you can expect from your technologies uh, in terms of cardiac mechanics and the effect on cardiac mechanics. Can you, will you unload the ventricle or will you increase the, the load to the ventricle? And uh, it's clear on the left upper hand, you see what's happening when you introduce an IVEC2L. And please compare this with the balloon pump on the right hand side, lower panel. And basically both are pulsatile systems, the only pulsatile systems on this slide. And it's clear that uh, they're driven by the same intra aortic balloon pump console, the same driver, but the effect on the ventricle is uh, somewhat different. As a matter of fact, it is more pronounced with IVEC2L. Basically, to, uh, to put it in lay words, um, an uh, IVEC2L is a balloon pump on steroids. It really, uh, it will have much stronger effects on the ventricle in terms of unloading, as you clearly see that the shift of this PV loop is more pronounced to the left and downwards as compared to what's happening with a balloon pump. It, it really mimics what you can obtain with an Impella CP. But if you then look at, um, for instance, ECMO, that's a totally different story. With ECMO, you will not reduce the afterload, you will increase the load to the ventricle. And this has quite uh, consequences, especially in the ischemic heart, because the area under this curve, under this um, PV loop, also represents this PV area also represents myocardial oxygen consumption. The smaller it is, the less myocardial oxygen consumption and the better it is for an ischemic ventricle where there is a lack of oxygen. If you then move, if you shift this curve to the right, then this entire area becomes much bigger and you increase myocardial oxygen consumption. So basically this is the reason why ECMO in uh, high-risk PCI doesn't make a lot of sense because you will increase the afterload and you will also increase the myocardial oxygen need to, your, to, uh, to the heart. This is where Impella, but definitely also IVEC2L uh, make a clear uh, difference because they unload the ventricle and they reduce myocardial oxygen consumption. Now we looked at our data in the thorax center uh, in almost 200 patients and we published that last year. This is 2019, I see that there is a nine missing. And we looked at the patients who were treated with a high-risk PCI and we compared that in a propensity-matched analysis uh, 
to uh, patients who were treated with um, unprotected um, high-risk PCI. And it becomes clear that uh, the patients who were treated with uh, MCS facilitated uh, high-risk PCI had um, a reduction in their primary endpoint of MACE, but also less need for adrenaline, no cardiac arrests during those procedures. There was uh, one case of limp ischemia because you are working with large bore access, no cardioversions, no chest compressions because there was no CPR, no need for intubations, no need for escalation uh, with mechanical circulatory support during the procedure. And there was also no death on the table within the first 22, 24 hours. So those were quite um, promising results supporting the use and the practice of mechanical circulatory support in the thorax center. And you may ask yourself, yeah, but okay, this is the thorax center. Why, why were you not treating all these patients with um, mechanical circulatory support? Well, that was because we were looking at data from uh, 2010 to 2019. And then that area, especially in the early 2000 teens, um, there were still operators who refused to use mechanical circulatory support. So if the patient was unlucky and the patient had been discussed in the heart team by a colleague that was not uh, proficient with mechanical circulatory support, he might uh, have been treated with a high-risk PCI without support. And turns out that, you know, if you match them to the patients who were treated with mechanical circulatory support, they were not doing as good. We have uh, access to different uh, mechanical circulatory support technology, and that was also introduced and included in this study. We had patients using PulseCAT, Impella, CP, and HeartMate. It was uh, more or less a 50-50 split between Impella, CP, and uh, PulseCAT. And it's clear that uh, the effect benefit of using mechanical circulatory support was there uh, for younger patients, older patients, but as importantly also with unprotected left main uh, and in patients with high syntax scores. And it was also obvious from uh, those data that the higher the syntax score, there was also a higher likelihood of using circulatory support. And the worse the LV function was, there was also a higher likelihood of using the support and still outcomes were better in the patients who were treated with mechanical circulatory support. Now let's zoom in on the concept of the IVEC2L. It is a completely percutaneous technology that introduces this nitinol reinforced single lumen catheter with a size of 17 French. And then you implant this through a common femoral axis into the left ventricle, so a retrograde approach. And then you put the tip in the ventricle and then seven, centim seven uh, centimeters from the tip there is the outlet which contains a bidirectional valve that allows to, uh, to suck out uh, blood during systole and uh, from the ventricle and give it back uh, up above the aortic valve in the ascending aorta through this bidirectional valve during diastole. And the whole system is then uh, driven by an uh, intra-aortic balloon pump console that is connected to this extracorporeal uh, pump. So the pump drives blood in and out of the system and the pump then is activated by the balloon pump console. This is how uh, we uh, do the insertion. We typically make a bend on a, a stiff wire Nowadays, we use the safari wire for this, and then we fill the chamber with saline, heparinized saline. We make a wet-to-wet -wet connection. Oh, this is, by the way, the bidirectional valve. We make a wet-to-wet -wet connection of um, the pump with the catheter. And we're going to see that... Um, there again, the valve, the bidirectional valve. We cross the valve with a pigtail, insert the stiff wire, and this is an O35 wire. So that's why you can also use the, the safer safari wire. And then over that wire, you introduce the catheter. And that uh, is very, it's very easy to maneuver this thing through the aorta. And then the wet to wet connection of the pump with the catheter and then you connect it on the other, other side with the balloon pump console. 
So a genuine intra-aortic balloon pump console. We're all familiar with that. And then the device starts pumping. It's driven by the balloon pump. So there is a membrane. On the outside of the membrane is the helium gas by the balloon pump. And on the inside of the balloon is the blob. And then at the end, it's just disconnecting the balloon pump and you withdraw the system. During these procedures, we, uh, we use an ACT of around 250. Okay, so what is the performance of this IVEC 2L? Uh, it is dependent on the heart rate because you, uh, it is in synchrony with the cardiac uh, heart rhythm, with the cardiac uh, heart rate. So basically, and it, it can generate a stroke volume, the pump itself generates a stroke volume of 21 milliliters. So it's, it's not, an, not unexpected that uh, at one point when the heart rate becomes too fast, that also the performance of the valve will go down because the, it can no longer obtain its maximum stroke volume. And there is this sweet spot between uh, 60 and 100 beats per minute, but the optimal performance is around 75 beats per minute. And by the, uh, reaching that, you will reach a um, overall additional output on the existing cardiac output of up to 1.8 liters per minute. And uh, on average, you reach 1.5 to 1.6 liters per minute. If you end up, for instance, with an atrial fibrillation during your procedure with a fast uh, ventricular response or a VT or whatever, you can also switch to the intrinsic auto mode and then the pump will start functioning for instance at 80 beats per minute but independent from the heart rate and still it will it will be able to generate an output of 1.3 liters per minute so this was a, a case that uh, this is from uh, cases real cases real life cases that we did in the erasmus uh, we have a series we did a a prospective study of 30 patients where we did high-risk PCI using the IVEC-2L, but at the same time, we also had invasive uh, PV loop assessment using a conducted scatheter. And just focus on the, the middle portion of this slide where you see in the dotted lines, the initial situation. And then when we switched on the IVEC-2L, immediately we could appreciate the shift of the PV loop to the left, clearly indicating unloading of the ventricle, but also downwards over time, complete unloading of the ventricle, operating at lower volumes and lower pressures. On the right-hand side, you see what's happening on the pressure volume area. I think this is a very important parameter because it makes it, makes it uh, easy to understand that myocardial oxygen consumption is improving. If this um, PV, area gets smaller, then also the myocardial oxygen consumption and the myocardial oxygen need of the ventricle goes down. So this slide summarizes what's happening. So with this pump, you are in synchrony with the ventricle. Uh, in systole, it will suck out blood uh, from the ventricle. So basically through uh, aspiration, it will, by doing that, unload the ventricle during systole and it will reduce myocardial oxygen consumption. At, on the other hand, during diastole, it will eject the blood into the ascending aorta. By doing so, you create this, the same phenomenon that we know from interaortic balloon pump, that is diastolic augmentation. By uh, performing diastolic augmentation, you will increase coronary blood flow, increase the mean arterial pressure and the diastolic blood pressure and increase myocardial oxygen supply. So this is basically, uh, in short, what you can expect from the IVEC-2L. This is a case that we also um, presented and also published in Euro Intervention. The same concept, a clear shifting with the IVEC-2L uh, to the left in terms of the PV loops, and then the overall cardiac output during uh, MCS support with IVEC-2L increases. You see that, uh, the PV area goes down, less myocardial oxygen consumption. We are all familiar with the uh, concept uh, that when we use large bore access for mechanical circulatory support, that we will uh, have compared to balloon pump more impact on the hemodynamics. So the wedge pressure will go down, the cardiac index will go up, 
but this will come at the price of more lag ischemia and bleeding. And I think this is very important because um, it is always the balance of improving the output and trying to uh, assure hemodynamic stability, but it may come at the cost of bleeding and vascular access complications uh, when you're not um, a master of getting large bore access. And I think this is really essential when you want to go into that direction, into the using mechanical circulatory support. And there, procedural planning becomes important. And we have learned from our structural heart experience that uh, if you have the time to get to prepare yourselves, then it makes sense to have an appreciation of the iliofemoral uh, trajectory before you enter a case and before you get your um, large bore access. This is why uh, we also use CT scans if um, kidney function uh, allows it to, to get that appreciation. And we insist on doing ultrasound guidance and uh, also a confirmation of the common femoral artery puncture after we get access. So we inserted the six French sheet. Well, that's the time where we do a quick uh, angio check just to make sure that we are above the bifurcation, below the epigastric artery, and we are in the safe zone. At the end of the procedure, closure of the access side is very important uh, because it doesn't stop after uh, the PCI. You make, uh, we, we, we use either suture-based or plug-based closures, and we make sure that our ACT is below 250 when we uh, proceed with uh, excess closure and we monitor arterial blood pressure. We want to have a systolic blood pressure below 160 millimeters of mercury before we start with excess uh, closure. So the, the kind of closure devices that we're using, we typically use either two proglides or Manta closure. Uh, when uh, when we uh, do Manta, uh, when we use uh, IVEC2L, uh, the Perky seal is still under development in seal at one point uh, was on the verge of commercial uh, uh, availability, but uh, things are happening in that regard. So I think that Perky Seal and Inseal are still, um, yeah, have some work on the table before they will become commercially available. Still, this slide um, illustrates that when you're using uh, closure devices, I think it is mandatory to confirm your, uh, your results. Uh, because this is what's happening. You can, have, um, you can have hemostasis, but that doesn't mean that there cannot be other issues like occlusions and severe dissection. So you always have to pay attention to these uh, issues other than incomplete hemostasis. Um, just to, to, final, uh, to, to wrap up uh, some words on closure devices, we recently completed and are about to publish this randomized study where we uh, randomized patients to either Manta closure or two proglides. This was a study in Erasmus uh, and Clinique Pasteur in Toulouse. We enrolled uh, more than 200 patients. And uh, what we, we, we could notice that there was no difference in vascular complications between Manta or proglide, although numerically we had more uh, complications with Manta, but not statistically significant. But, was, but what was also striking was that uh, vascular closure device failure occurred more often with proglides than with Manta. And the time to hemostasis was also faster with Manta than with proglides. And this uh, next slide illustrates basically what's going on. So no significant difference in uh, the number of vascular complications, but vascular closure device failure was significantly more frequent with proglides. The kind of maneuvers that you had to do to correct this failure was different between the two technologies. With sutures, you had the ability to uh, use additional closure devices, for instance, an angio seal or an additional proglide. That option is not available when you use a Manta. The, in the majority of cases, we, uh, we proceeded with prolonged manual compression. So we know that you have faster hemostasis with Manta than with proglides, but if there is no hemostasis, you will, uh, you will need to compress for a bit longer to, uh, to allow, for instance, the collagen to interact with the blood and do a, a perfect or, or a complete seal. If that doesn't work, you will, you will find yourself 
using bailout stents and surgical uh, or surgical bailout closure. And this uh, is still in the minority of cases. Um, I think we use uh, for Manta uh, covered stents in less than 2% of the cases and surgery in less than 1%. This, uh, with uh, suture-based closure, it is around 1%. So this is when, if you would ask me, okay, but when would you use suture-based closure and when would you use plug-based closure? Well, uh, this is summarized in this slide. If prolamine is no problem, then you can use both. If, if you preferably not use, not want to use prolamine, then uh, I would recommend you uh, to use suture-based closure. When would I not, uh, when I would prefer not to use uh, prolamine, that is in the, in the context of uh, patients who are not uh, preloaded with DAPT. If patients are on dual antiplatelet therapy for more than six hours, then there is no problem using uh, protamine. If they're not, if you just loaded your patient with uh, ticagrelor or clopidogrel, it will take two hours to six hours to have complete uh, antiplatelet effect. And in those cases, I'm a little bit careful uh, with, the, uh, with the use of protamine. Uh, in the cat lab environment, there is no issue with both technologies. Uh, also in the ICU, I have been using uh, both um, technologies. Uh, and if uh, patients have been on uh, mechanical circulatory support for more than 72 hours, my preference would be a Manta closure. Uh, if patients are morbidly obese, I would prefer sutures. If there is heavy calcification, I would again prefer a plug-based Manta closure. So back to PulseCat, IVEC2L, it is, not, uh, it, is, it is being commercially available for uh, the last two years. There are 44 countries uh, open now in the world and uh, the uptake of this technology is uh, on the rise. And uh, I mentioned the 17 French catheter. These days we work with an uh, 18 French sheet. Well, this will convert to a sheetless uh, procedure. Then uh, as is demonstrated in this PIC case that we did uh, a couple of weeks ago, it is definitely feasible and it will uh, allow this uh, procedure to become 15 French equivalent as a sheetless procedure, more or less something similar as what you have with an Evolute that is 14 French, um, 14 French equivalent. But if you use a sheet, you will need a 16 French sheet. In conclusion, I think uh, IVEC2L is a valuable mechanical circulatory support in the context of high-risk PCI. It provides favorable effects on cardiac mechanics, oxygen consumption, and coronary perfusion. Access site management is paramount. It is essential for any mechanical circulatory support, but it's also important to determine proper timing, proper insertion techniques, and also uh, you need to understand the effects of the device on the cardiac mechanics. So with that, I open the, the floor for some questions. Perfect.